The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, uh, this is uh, Mike Eisen. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining today. Um, I'm going to be uh, introducing, I think, the first uh, session. So we can, someone else is gonna, okay. We can move forward. Uh, I wanna thank all of the uh, other societies uh, that are uh, contributing to this, AOPO, AST, ASTS, CST, ESOT, uh, ISHLT, NATCO, TTS, and UNOS uh, for helping to pull this uh, second uh, meeting together. Next slide. Uh, a special shout out, I think, to Emily Blumberg, who uh, really got the ball rolling on this and has been instrumental in uh, moving the entire process uh, forward. But it really has taken uh, a team of uh, experts from all the various societies uh, to get the uh, meeting up and running. Next slide. So we're going to start uh, today with what I think is going to be incredibly exciting, uh, an update on available data and some updates on uh, current uh, registries. Um, I, I would say before we move into this is that uh, getting data is going to be critically important uh, and I would encourage all centers to uh, participate in one of the existing uh, registries uh, to put your data in so that we have useful information to uh, provide reports like we'll be doing today. You can go to the TTS uh, website, tts.org, and click on the, the COVID-19 dashboard, uh, and uh, there's a section on available registries, uh, and you can find one that uh, uh, you might be interested in participating if you're not uh, participating already. I'm gonna introduce the first three speakers and then let them uh, proceed with their pr presentations. First, we'll have David Klassen from uh, UNOS providing an update on impact on the OPTN. We'll then have uh, Massimo uh, Cardillo uh, from the National Transplant uh, Agency in Italy uh, provide us on an impact, uh, an information on the impact of donation and transplantation in Italy. We'll then uh, turn and get some uh, information from uh, two experts, Olivia Cates uh, from uh, University of Washington, a fellow uh, who's been really pulling together a great multi-center case uh, report registry. Uh, and then we'll hear uh, from New York from Marcus Piera, uh, who's the director of uh, transplant ID at Columbia uh, to uh, give us some insight about uh, COVID-19 among solid organ transplant patients. After their presentations, we'll start talking uh, a bit on uh, a discussion between the speakers uh, and uh, questions that you may have. So we'll start by turning it over to uh, Dave. Um, hi, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, this is David Clausen. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at UNOS, and I'm gonna give a, a brief talk on the data that we've accumulated that, that uh, shows the impact of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on transplants and donors within the OPTN uh, in the United States. Um, before I get started, I really would like to acknowledge um, the dedication of the transplant community as a whole to caring for the patients uh, that we're responsible for uh, and providing access as best we can for transplantation. And also like to acknowledge uh, those of us who uh, work in the face of personal risk. I think that's important to always remember. Um, and additionally, I'd like to echo that uh, what uh, Brian Shepard at UNOS has commented on uh, in, that communication and cooperation are the hallmarks of our, of our transplant community, and they probably have never uh, been more important than they are, than they are today. Um, and so with that, I'm going to, uh, if you could give my first uh, slide, please. Okay, so this figure, or this slide here uh, shows the number of uh, deceased donor transplants uh, by week. Uh, that have been occurring in the OPTN. Um, the figure on the left uh, shows uh, by specific organ. Um, the uh, y-axis actually is the uh, time from the beginning of February uh, up until actually the data ends uh, Thursday of last week, April, uh, April the 9th. And what you can see, the top line, the blue line, uh, is the number of um, deceased donor kidney transplants done. You can see it's changed from an average weekly number of about 375 and has dropped down to about uh, 220, which is about a, represents a 40% decrease. 
most of that decrease really has been apparent since the beginning of March. Uh, this, the next line, sort of the, the uh, uh, light green uh, line, represents liver transplants, and they've decreased by about a third, uh, again, most prominently since the beginning of March. Uh, the red line is heart transplantation, which has also decreased uh, by about 40%. And the bottom line is lung transplantation, although uh, there are fewer lung transplants being done um, across the country. Actually, the impact on a percent basis has been the greatest there, and they've decreased uh, by about 60 percent. Uh, we've attempted to look at this geographically across the country, and these are uh, that's shown on the panels on the right. Um, and we've divided it uh, into some broad geographic areas. These do not represent the typical uh, OPTN regional uh, distributions, but rather, uh, again, broader uh, uh, areas of the country. And you can see, I think, the impact in terms of number of transplants has been very prominent in the Northeast, as we might expect, but also in other parts of the country as well. The North Midwest uh, and the Southeast in particular have shown decreases. In the last week or so, there has been some suggestion in parts of the country that, that the rate of uh, decline has slowed and in some cases even um, increased slightly. So this may represent uh, sort of the flattening of our donor transplantation curves, if you will. But again, these data, these data change uh, very quickly and what we see now may not be the same next week. Could I have the next slide, please? Uh, these are living donor transplants across the country. Um, and what you can see is, again, started in the beginning of March, uh, living donor transplants have decreased very, very dramatically. Um, we now have just a few occurring uh, uh, each week. Um, these have been in the, in the mid-Atlantic area and a little bit in the southwest parts of the United States. But in most parts of the country, living donor transplantation has uh, stopped completely. Uh, the panel on the right shows uh, uh, a number of things, waitlist additions uh, and waitlist inactivations. And, and what you can see here is on the green line, that waitlist additions uh, have declined a bit over the past month, but not as dramatically as transplants over, uh, overall. Um, the blue bars, though, indicate uh, inactivations uh, based on COVID-19 uh, uh, related issues. And so a large number of programs have uh, been inactivating patients on the, on the waitlist. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in contrast to uh, don deceased donor transplants, these are the actual uh, deceased donors that are recovered, uh, again, by week. And this represents what the OPOs across the country uh, have been able to do. Um, and again, starting on the left, uh, is the total number of uh, deceased donors procured over the United States uh, as a whole. Um, again, the first data points start at the beginning of March. Um, and running up to, toward the end of last week. Um, and what you can see is that overall, there has been about a third to, uh, to almost now half, 50% uh, decrease in the number of donors recovered um, uh, every week. Um, you can see again, geographically, uh, there have been changes uh, in the no uh, North Midwest uh, and the Southwest. Um, in the last, we monitor this data actually every single day, um, and we've separated out ge it geographically a little differently in the most recent iteration that's not seen on this slide, but we've separated out uh, the Northeast into the Mid-Atlantic and, and, and really essentially New England. Um, and the, the New England area, which includes New York, has seen a very uh, significant decrease in the number of donors. Um, so this, uh, again, has continued. Um, again, the rate, the rate of decline in donors has started to, um, to abate a little bit, um, which may uh, signal some stabilization in uh, deceased donor recoveries. But I, what I would point out is, although we've seen a significant decrease, uh, the, the number is not zero. And there are still uh, you know, many, many OPOs. All the OPOs are actually working aggressively uh, and still are able to maintain um, uh, donor procurements across the country. Could I have the next slide? Um, the last slide then on, in my uh, brief section is uh, just really to highlight uh, very briefly some of the policy and safety considerations that the OPTN has done. And um, uh, we're just not gonna go into these in great deal detail, but 
on a, a relatively rapid basis, we've changed some policy uh, that has relaxed patient data. Um, we've extended the use of data for uh, determining listing status. Uh, we've made some adjustments in terms of uh, wait time continuation and modification of wait time initiation. Uh, MPSC monitoring and enforcement criteria uh, will be shifting. Uh, and we're working, looking uh, at the eligible death definition as part of the OPO uh, metrics. Um, we've made a recommendation for the use of local recovery teams for organ procurement. That's not a, a mandatory uh, policy, but it is a recommendation. Um, and we have also are looking very closely at COVID-19 donor-derived disease transmission reporting. We've seen um, a modest number of uh, reports of potential disease transmission, but as of yet, there has not been any um, documented uh, and confirmed uh, COVID-19 disease transmission. So with that, I will stop and turn it back uh, to Mike. All right, and we'll go straight into the next speaker, Massimo. Yes, as uh, for Italy, the situation uh, for uh, COVID-19 outbreak is improving in the last week. As the general situation in Italy, we reached uh, about uh, 155,000 uh, infected patients uh, out of 1 million of performed uh, swab in the general population, 20,000 uh, patient deceased and 35,000 uh, recovered. Uh, 100,000 are still positive and 30% of them are hospitalized with the symptoms and 3% are in intensive care units in uh, uh, intensive treatment. As uh, regards the impact on donation and transplantation uh, activity, uh, since the starting of the outbreak, we uh, foreseen to perform in all deceased donors the, um, <coughs> to investigate the presence of the virus with the, a testing on the bronco uh, aspirate that is mandatory for all deceased donors, and uh, the uh, <coughs> pharyngeal or nasal swab is uh, mandatory for recipient. The impact on uh, organ donation and transplantation is very similar to that uh, observed uh, in the UNOS data. You can see in this slide the weekly trend of organ donation in Italy by week. And as you can see, starting from the 24th of February, we, uh, we had a slight decrease in the number of uh, referred donors and the utilized donor too. And uh, only in the, in the last week, we observed a slight uh, reprise. Uh, as you can see, we had uh, 45 donors referred in the last week and the 21 of them were, uh, were used. In the next slide, <clears throat> in the next slide you find the weekly trend uh, in organ transplantation. That is the consequence uh, of the uh, decrease in organ donation. So, as you can see, uh, in the last uh, six uh, uh, weeks we observe about a 40% decrease in transplantation activity, and the most of this decrease uh, was in the uh, region of the north of the country. Uh, anyway, uh, as you can see in the last week, we observed a reprise. We hope that uh, uh, this will be confirmed in the, in the, next, uh, in the next days. And uh, so um, as regards the, the last slide, you, uh, please Erika, will you please show the last slide? Uh, these are data that uh, we are uh, uh, collecting for the uh, COVID-19 uh, positive patient among the transplanted patient and the patient on the waiting list. We are collecting this uh, uh, data by merging two databases, the one general database of all the uh, COVID positive cases in Italy and the database of uh, uh, transplanted patients in the National Transplant Agency uh, that I coordinate. So, uh, as you can see, we found uh, uh, one, these are preliminary data anyway, we found 146 transplanted patients that are COVID 19 positive with a, a prevalence of 0. 
36 uh, percent that is fourfold compared to the uh, overall prevalence in the general population we are dealing with uh, about uh, 38,000 uh, transplanted patients from uh, 2000 to March uh, 2020. Uh, as you can see, uh, these positive patients are uh, in uh, 17 cases heart, 21 liver, 2 pancreas, 8 lung, 103 uh, kidney. We uh, investigate uh, the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 positive patients among the patients on the waiting list for organ transplantation. We found the 73 positive patients. Uh, that means uh, uh, out of uh, 8,000 patients on the waiting list, that means about a prevalence of about 0.86%. That is about uh, uh, double compared with the prevalence uh, among the transplanted patients. And this is also important data to, uh, to show and to understand. Thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and for this opportunity. Thank you. And we'll move on to Olivia's talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm Olivia Cates. I'm a second year infectious disease fellow at the University of Washington. And with the support of my mentors, Dr. Cindy Fisher, Bob Rakita, Erica Lees, and Ajit LeMay, I'm leading our multi-site case report registry project. Uh, next slide, please. So we've developed what I hope is a user-friendly electronic case report form, and all the data requested are de-identified and IRB exempt, allowing for speedy enrollment. But the most important feature of our project has been the guiding principle of open collaboration. This really would not be possible without our contributors, now more than 50 clinicians around the world, whose hard work and goodwill have been truly incredible. Uh, one way that we hope to repay their generosity, or at least pay it forward, is by regularly sharing insights from our project, even as it's still in development. Next slide, please. When I prepared these slides on Friday, we had 120 cases reported to the registry. The median age of patients is 56. Although the youngest patient is three years old, fewer than 10 pediatric cases are included so far. Patient demographics roughly align with the demographics of transplant recipients in the United States, where most of these cases have been reported. The vast majority of patients have at least one comorbidity, and most have two or more with hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and coronary artery disease most common. Patients in the registry are recipients of 82 kidney transplants, 21 liver transplants, 15 heart transplants, and 10 lung transplants, and some patients have received more than one transplant. The median time post-transplant is five years, and currently there are 16 reports of patients who were transplanted in 2020. The majority of patients are on maintenance immunosuppression with tacrolimus, often in combination with prednisone and mycophenolate. 10% are on cyclosporin, and 10% are on mTOR inhibitors. 16% of patients have recently received induction or intensified immunosuppression. When patients present, 50% have fever. Most patients have lower respiratory tract symptoms. 30% have upper respiratory tract symptoms and 30% have gastrointestinal symptoms. For the approximately 15% of patients who are presenting without cough or dyspnea, the symptoms that prompted testing have been isolated fever, diarrhea, or myalgia. A very small number of patients have been asymptomatic and identified by screening tests. Next slide, please. 30% of these patients have been managed in the outpatient setting, 70% have been hospitalized, and 49% of all patients have been admitted to an intensive care unit. 19% of all patients have been intubated. 20% of patients had suspected concurrent infections, the majority of which were bacterial. 60% received some experimental treatment for SARS-CoV-2, with almost half of all patients treated with hydroxychloroquine. Although there's been discussion of a possible protective effect of immunosuppression or even an antiviral effect of mycophenolate, 70% of patients had their immunosuppression reduced, and in most cases, this meant reducing or holding mycophenolate. I've been asked whether we see a difference in outcomes based on organ transplanted, and looking at our preliminary data, I observe higher rates of hospitalization and intubation among lung transplant recipients, 
I've been asked whether more recently transplanted patients present or progress differently, but so far I've not observed a difference among the 16 recently transplanted patients. I've been asked whether outcomes vary based on the maintenance immunosuppression regimen, specifically for patients on serolimus, but I've not observed a difference among the 13 patients receiving that drug. And I've been asked about mortality, and while follow-up is not completed, so far 11% of patients have passed away. Our study will ultimately address all of these questions and more, uh, but today I have to emphasize that these data are preliminary. They've not been examined for confounders and no formal statistical analyses have been performed. The initial case report form does not require a fixed follow-up duration, but beginning today, contributors will be invited to fill out 28-day follow-up forms with updates to clinical course, management, complications, and outcomes, all standardized to the 28-day follow-up period. It's our hope that the result of this project will be a richly detailed and high quality contribution to the body of literature addressing COVID-19 and transplant recipients. I personally welcome your questions and comments and I'm making every effort to be available by email. Um, once again, thank you to my local mentors, to all of our contributors and their teams, many of whom are listening and even speaking today. Uh, and I'd also like to extend my best wishes to colleagues at Columbia University, my previous institution, including past teachers, Dr. Pereira and Dr. Hussein. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, we'll move on uh, to the uh, center of the epidemic uh, in New York and Marcus will update us on the experience at New York Presbyterian. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Olivia, uh, for the best wishes. And uh, thank you for the invitation to present some of our data on what we've experienced so far here in New York City. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, we're in a hyper-endemic setting at this point. So the data that I will be including here uh, is for New York Presbyterian. So this was not a misspelling NYP. It, it comprises of two large institutions, Columbia and Cornell Medical Centers. Next slide, please. So as of um, and last Friday, when I put these slides together, we had 122 patients, uh, solid organ transplant recipients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. The number as of today is up to 151 just highlighting how dynamic and ongoing this infection is here in New York City. We have been able so far to analyze 90 patients as of April 3rd. And uh, for the purposes of the data that I will be presenting, we classify these patients in by disease severity. And to keep it simple, um, are all the outpatient management or, or those who remain outpatient were the mild severity, those who require admission to the general medical floor were the moderate disease patients, and then severe disease were those who require mechanical ventilation or an admission to the intensive care unit or who ultimately passed away from COVID-19. Next slide, please. So the next following slides will be data rich with a number of uh, tables. So in the first red rectangle that's gonna come up, we looked at age, as you, as you know, it's a significant risk factor in the general population. And we actually found that in our cohort, it was also quite significant, in particular in those over 60 years of age were far more likely to have severe disease than otherwise. Gender, on the other hand, did not seem to contribute too much to disease severity, at least in this small cohort. And just to piggyback on Olivia's initial question as well about different types of organ transplants, we have not seen a predilection for disease severity among any of the transplants, but you can see the breakdown here. By far, we had kidney transplants being affected by COVID-19. That's generally due to it being a large transplant uh, a center for kidneys, but the lung transplants uh, uh, were the second most affected. And, uh, um, but they were, they were not more likely to, be, to have a severe disease, at least as of now. Um, again, another important question was the um, time from transplant to development of COVID-19 and whether that would be a risk factor for disease severity. As you can see here, and this is actually in the next uh, uh, rectangle, uh, it did not seem to correlate. Most of our patients were many years out from transplant, uh, but we also looked at the subset of those within a month of transplant, of which we had three so far, and as well as those within the last year, and this did not seem to correlate with disease severity. We also looked at the comorbidities of these patients, and this is not all inclusive. I had to take some of this, some of the risk factors or comorbidities out of here. But uh, in the next slide, in the next rectangle, you would see that hypertension did seem to correlate, just like in the general population with disease severity. And then in the next rectangle, also active cancer, we had three patients who were concurrently being treated with chemotherapy, and and, and those three have not done so well. 
We looked at CKD, diabetes, chronic lung disease. We actually had one patient with HIV who had kidney transplant, and those did not seem to correlate with disease severity. And then this is the next uh, a box is our baseline immunosuppressive regimens for all of those patients. And you can see, you can go back to the last slide. Um, it did, baseline immunosuppression did not seem to correlate either with uh, disease severity. And again, many of our patients were on mycophenolate. So to raise that issue, whether that is a, a potent antiviral or not, it didn't seem to be the case here. Next slide. So about 76% of our patients in this entire cohort were ultimately hospitalized. And the next two slides are about those hospitalized patients only, for which we had a little bit more data. So in terms of the vitals, which is the first red um, rectangle, the significant vital signs on presentation were the tachypnea and hypoxia. And you can see here, they were strongly correlated with disease severity, and particularly the hypoxia. And then we, we were able to report on a number, of, a number of initial lab results, blood counts, chemistries, and other inflammatory markers, which are included in the next, in the, in the, in the, in the, at the bottom of this table. And um, white blood cell count did not seem to correlate. And we also looked at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, something that had been discussed, which is the NLR over there in the table, um, as potentially predictive of disease severity. And although those numbers, 5.27, is a high ratio in general, it didn't seem to di be differentiated between disease severities. Albumin, interestingly, did seem to correlate. So for those who, who had, in general, a median lower albumin, seem to have more disease severity. And whether that is representative of additional underlying comorbidities or frailty or, or different issues, that seemed to be correlated. Hepatitis did not seem to be significant in this cohort. Neither did the creatinine levels, which were at baseline elevated for many of our patients. And then, as many centers are curious about the inflammatory markers and whether those can be predictive, I know there's a lot of literature out there for the general population. These are the initial lab results for our population, including procalcitonin, C-reactive protein, D-dimer, ferritin, and IL-6 levels. Uh, um, as many of you know, we were looking into blocking IL-6 receptor blockers and whether that correlates with severity of disease. So by and large, the only significant initial lab that was uh, uh, per perhaps predictive of severity was uh, uh, procalcitonin. Whether that is uh, um, something significant or whether it is related to superimposed bacterial infections, we were not sure. Uh, we have not found uh, many patients with bacterial infections in this cohort, at least, so we're not sure exactly the significance of procalcitonin. But mind you, if you look at C-reactive protein, D-dimer, ferritin, and even IL-6 levels, those are elevated in basically the entire cohort, um, but not particularly predictive. Next slide. And then the last table uh, are our treatment manage, both management, both for immunosuppression as, actual, as well as antiviral therapies. So in the first red rectangle, we looked basically upon uh, um, meeting and us in infectious diseases, it was agreed upon that uh, in terms of uh, changes in immunosuppression that we would go first with decreasing or holding antimetabolites, despite some of that literature about, again, mycophenolate having antiviral properties. And again, it, it, it seems difficult to make any conclusions by this, but most of our patients had antimetabolites decreased or held, and it didn't seem to correlate with disease severity or progression of disease. The next red rectangle highlights our antiviral therapies. So we decided on hydroxychloroquine for most hospitalized patients who had significant risk factors and immunosuppression was included in that category. So as you can see, 92% of our patients receive hydroxychloroquine during their hospitalizations. Columbia, as opposed to Cornell, did include azithromycin initially in our protocol. So you can see that 44 of those patients did receive concurrent azithromycin. We later dropped that as part of our recommendation, so you can see that some of the numbers dropped off later. We were able to enroll a few patients on remdesivir only. There was initially a lot of trouble enrolling them due to drug supply, um, but, uh, but we certainly have picked up lately. And then the next rectangle highlights our immune, immunomodulatory therapies, including bolus steroids for uh, patients who were believed to be either in this sort of cytokine storm state or require some increased uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, therapies, as well as tocilizumab, our anti-IL-6 uh, receptor blocker. So eight patients received that. 
and you can see that most of those patients were already in the severe disease state. And then the next rectangle shows the, the, the breakdown in terms of the highest level respiratory support for those patients. So most of the moderate patients require either room air nasal cannula, but some did require non-regreather masks. And the, the vast majority of our patients in the severe disease category ultimately were intubated and require mechanical ventilation and ICU admission. We did have three patients who chose not to be intubated, did not want to uh, proceed to um, ICU, so they, they went more in the route of palliative care and uh, passed away before any of those interventions. And we included them in the severe category because they would have been intubated otherwise. And then in the next slide, ultimate outcomes. So 19 of our patients ultimately went to the ICU. That's 30% of the hospitalized cohort. Um, 10 patients ultimately passed away. Um, that's 15% of our hospitalized cohort. And um, the good news is that 18 of those patients, or about almost 30%, have been discharged as of April 3rd. Next slide. So some concluding remarks, uh, you know, it's obviously too early to tell and we don't necessarily have good measures for comparison, but it seems that COVID-19 seems to have a high level of morbidity and mortality in our transplant population so far here in New York. 11% um, of the entire cohort uh, uh, died, 15% um, of those hospitalized and 37% of those who went to the ICU have passed away already. Um, obviously we don't have a reliable denominator because there was, severely limited testing abilities for uh, all of our patients. Um, and despite aggressive uh, uh, reaching out to our patients and trying to, to test them, we really don't have a denominator. So we don't know what these numbers really mean so far. Um, as many of you have concluded in your centers, hydroxychloroquine is of uncertain efficacy, um, in particular for those patients with more severe disease or um, have been in a hospital for a long time. Uh, obviously, we don't have we haven't had the ability to analyze that data so much yet. Um, um, but then some solid organ transplant specific considerations, we obviously need to better understand what is the optimal immunosuppressive management? Is it really reducing or holding mycophenolate or additional strategies? The same with immunomodulators. Uh, these patients are already immunosuppressed, but certainly what does it mean to add additional uh, uh, therapies like IL-6 receptor blockers? Uh, we had eight patients who received tocilizumab. Many of them, unfortunately, had received it late in the stage, had already been intubated for a day or two, and we did not see necessarily great results from that. Um, and then there is some concern, as many of you know, about false negative re results of the initial PC nasopharyngeal swab. We had seven patients who initially were negative on the PCR, but due to high suspicion of symptoms, were retested one to several days later and ultimately became positive. So this is an important consideration as well as we rely on that test for most of our management. And then last, just uh, uh, as David Kleisen was talking about uh, um, uh, donor-derived uh, infections. We don't know for sure, but we do have a case of a living donor liver transplant where the donor and the recipient, as well as several surgical staff, were ultimately found to be positive. Uh, with four days after that transplant. Again, this is probably reflective of, a, of an area that's hyperendemic, and we don't know necessarily if there was direct transmission or not, but certainly is an important consideration as you're deciding whether to proceed with living donor transplants or even deceased donor transplants in your own regions. And I think that's the end of my slides. Thank you. Perfect. So, so uh, thank you all for, for giving these uh, presentations. I think they really, uh, raise a number of questions. Um, I have one question first to uh, Dr. Claussen. Um, is UNOS collecting data on donor screening for uh, COVID-19? I'm sorry, could you say that collecting data on what? Donor screening for COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2? Uh, we are in the process of getting the data elements uh, uh, to do that. Uh, it isn't quite up uh, yet, but it should be shortly. So we're, we're trying to define exactly how, how that data should be collected and what data elements should, it should encompass. But the answer is yes, we will be doing that very soon. Perfect. Um, and then I thought it was kind of interesting that the mortality rate uh, from the multi-site uh, registry and the, the group at uh, uh, New York is about the same overall, 11%. Um, uh, 
Uh, I was wondering, Olivia, since uh, about half of the patients have gotten hydroxychloroquine, have you looked at all to see if there's differences in outcomes in those patients that received hydroxychloroquine versus those that hadn't? At this point, I haven't been able to look at differences in outcomes based on treatment, and I wanted to defer doing that until we had a more standardized uh, length of follow-up. I actually imagine a larger proportion of patients may be being treated after their initial reports are entered into the registry. Gotcha. And then, Marcus, any safety data uh, since almost all of your patients got hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, um, so far, no major adverse events. We have we've been monitoring for, in particular, QTC prolongation, and we have not seen that. And as you can imagine, we were also worried when we added azithromycin to that combination, we have also not seen that. Perfect. Um, and then is there a specific test that you're using that uh, may be giving a higher false negatives, or you think it's uh, sampling? That's a good question. It's we're using in-house PCR tests through. Uh, I, I believe it's a Roche platform. Um, it's. I, I think as as we know, there there are some some concerns um, uh, about just the nasal pharyngeal swab technique itself. Right, we're largely operator dependent. Um, and you can imagine in the emergency room or on the floors, um, whoever performs those tests perhaps might be uh, 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 using different techniques. Um, but I, but I believe that it's not necessarily, I don't think it would be the platform per se. Okay. And then one last question for Massimo. Do you have any uh, sense on what the mortality rate is uh, on the 146 patients, uh, transplant patients with COVID-19? Uh, yes, we are collecting this data, but uh, unfortunately it is not available at the moment. So I, I am not able to give this data at present. Okay. Well, to keep us on time, I'm going to turn it over to Emily to take us in through the next section. And I want to thank you, Mike, and I want to thank all of our speakers for the next section. Um, for the next section, we really wanted to focus on some key management issues, specifically as they pertain to different organs. So we'll be hearing first from Dr. Ali Hussein from Columbia Presbyterian to talk about renal implications. This talk will then be followed by Dr. Marta Ferrero from uh, the hospital clinic in Barcelona, Spain, where she will be focusing on ICU and pulmonary considerations. This talk will then be followed by Dr. Enrico Amarati, who will be talking about cardiac complications, and he's from Niguarda Hospital in Milano, Italy. Following that, Dr. Saima Aslam from the University of California in San Diego will be talking about therapeutics for COVID-19. And to end on a more optimistic note, we'll be hearing from Dr. Sejal Tana from Northwestern University talking about safe discharges and home management. So we'll start off now with Dr. Ali Hussein. Thanks very much. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, next slide as well. Thanks. So um, obviously the interest in the renal implications of SARS-CoV-2 has been increasing ever since it was recognized that the receptor was ACE2, which is obviously, as you all know, uh, present not only in the lung epithelial cells, but also in kid kidney epithelial cells. Um, early reports from cohorts around the world have had pretty uh, varying incidences of AKI reported. Uh, anywhere from half a percent to 29 percent. We think this is probably based on a few things like the severity of illness of people in the cohort, who's getting tested and what they're defining as AKI. Uh, overall, it seems like probably around 5 percent of hospitalized patients develop AKI, but 50 percent of those who end up in the ICU do. We've had a similar experience in Columbia, about um, uh, 50 percent of ICU patients will get AKI and about 30 percent will require renal replacement therapy. Um, the mechanism of this uh, AKI is not yet clear, um, but some autopsy studies that have recently come out have been helping us figure it out. So if you look at the top uh, right corner of the slide, um, that's autopsy data from six patients in China who, had, who died of uh, COVID-19. And in these six patients, uh, predominant, the predominant uh, kidney histologic findings were severe ATN, 
prominent lymph lymphocyte infiltrations you can see, uh, infiltration with macrophages. But in addition, on the right, that's C5B9 staining. So there's obviously also complement activation. And then they also found uh, viral antigens in tubular epithelial cells, as well as um, uh, all these inflammatory findings. Uh, in a separate Chinese series, which is in the bottom, uh, bottom right corner of the uh, slide, is an autopsy series from China that had uh, 26 patients who died of COVID-19, nine of whom had AKI. And in these 26 patients, again, there was a lot of ATN, uh, as well as even frank necrosis in some cases. Uh, in addition, they also saw these coronavirus particles in the tubular epithelium and photocytes. And then on the bottom left uh, uh, image, you can see they had uh, stain for the SARS-CoV nucleoprotein, which they found in the tubules. And then on the bottom right, they had noted an, an upregulation of ACE2 uh, in the renal tubules as well. So it seems like there's a multi-mechanism, uh, multiple mechanism for API, including both direct virulence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, ATN probably from critical illness, perhaps things like systemic hypoxia, rhabdo, that are all contributing. Um, from our standpoint in particular, uh, it's been important because AKI has carried a very poor prognosis, and that's kind of been borne out across multiple studies. So um, this slide actually is already out of date, but we tried to pool together the data from several sources to see if we could um, capture what's been discovered so far about the prognosis associated with AKI and COVID-19 and found a pooled odds ratio of death of about 24. So obviously it pretends a very poor prognosis. And we found that to be true in our kidney transplant recipients as well. So about a third of all of our kidney transplant recipients who've been admitted with COVID-19 have had AKI. That's similar to numbers from uh, the group from Brescia, Italy, who just published a case series in KI, which 30% of patients did. And virtually all of our kidney transplant recipients who have ended up in ICU have had AKI. So it's been a huge um, uh, complicating factor in their management especially as it's increased our burden of uh, providing renal replacement therapy in a, what's becoming an increasingly resource limited setting. So uh, for those of you who have not hit your peak yet, you know, be prepared to really expand your ability to provide conventional hemodialysis and, uh, and continuous renal replacement therapy in terms of uh, in increasing your access to staff who are qualified to do that, as well as supplies like solutions and machines. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but at the same time as we're talking about COVID-19 causing kidney dysfunction, it's also important to recognize that CKDs clearly emerge as a risk factor for severe disease. And this is really relevant to us in transplant in particular, given the really high proportion of transplant recipients who have CKD. I think, you know, numbers show that five years after a solid organ transplant, about a quarter of people have CKD. So uh, clearly something that makes our patients in particular a high group for uh, complications of this infection. Uh, again, there have been really variable reports from previously published cohorts of what proportion of COVID-19 in patients will have CKD. Um, but really, the, even though I'm showing a number here, one to 57%, that 57% was a, really an outlier. And most um, cohorts have reported a prevalence of around one to 6%, uh, averaging around 3% of patients who are admitted for COVID-19 having uh, chronic kidney disease. However, uniformly, everyone's reported worse outcomes in this subgroup. And again, when, uh, when we pooled uh, the data that's available so far, uh, the odds ratio for death for patients with CKD was three and a half. Um, and again, many of these patients will end up in the ICU, even those who, who don't die. And I think uh, once we close out a lot more cases, we'll see the death rate in the subgroup is probably even higher than been reported so far. Um, the, again, the reason for this all is not totally clear yet. Of course, uh, patients who have advanced kidney disease have some relative immunosuppression that might make them more susceptible. In addition, there's a really high prevalence of comorbidities in these patients. So in New York, for example, in patients with ESRD, uh, half are 65 or older, two-thirds of diabetes, half have CAD, half have heart failure. And these are all things that we know are associated with more severe uh, COVID-19 uh, presentations. But specifically, our transplant recipients, we know, are a particularly vulnerable group of patients with CKD. And uh, I won't repeat all this data because I know Marcus just went over it. But at our center, we've had, and at this point, more than 70 kidney transplant recipients who've had um, COVID-19. And even though their presentations have been similar to the general populations, you can see there on the right, um, their, uh, their outcomes with a pretty conservative immunosuppression re reduction uh, strategy has still resulted in 40% uh, developing acute kidney injury, 27% uh, requiring intubation. Uh, and although half have been discharged, among the other half, there's so many outstanding ca uh, open cases, that it's still too early for us to talk about case fatality. So, so I'd say we, we still have a lot to learn about this topic as well. Uh, next slide, please.
So and, and I'd say in summary, in reality, we, we just have a lot to figure out still. Uh, so we don't totally know the mechanism of kidney injury, like I mentioned. And one reason this is going to be important for us is if it's primarily an inflammatory response and immune response in the kidney, and, you know, what the implication of this will be for kidney allograft rejection is something we still have to figure out. You know, we have had our first case at our institution of someone who's had COVID-19 in concurrent rejection. Of course, the management of those patients is extremely complicated. Uh, until we know more about that as well, we won't really get a good sense of what the recovery prognosis or the timeline for recovery will be. And uh, so on the right there, you can see uh, we looked at all of our uh, fi first 15 patients who were admitted with COVID-19 and tried to see if we can match up their inflammatory markers in terms of CRP with both their outcomes or whether or not they developed AKI. And we were surprised to find that the patients who had the highest inflammatory markers both had uh, uh, resolving AKI, uh, but at the time their, their inflammatory markers were very high, whereas two of the patients who went home who had AKI, those bottom two black boxes, both had ongoing AKI despite the fact their inflammatory markers had come down uh, way lower than they were at time of admission. So clearly a lot not, not known. Um, and then finally, like I said, uh, the management of RRT and especially the management of fluid balance in the absence of readily available RRT, something that will continue to complicate our management of these patients. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Marta Farrero, and I used to be a heart transplant cardiologist, but I've been recently converted to a COVID intensivist. So I'm going to talk to you a bit uh, from my experience in the last weeks in the ICU with pulmonary complications. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding pulmonary complications, we need to be aware that most of the patients present mild symptoms and do not require ICU or respiratory support. But amongst those with pulmonary complications, the need of ICU and respiratory support can be high. Looking at this report this describing a thousand COVID patients cohort from China, we can see that the pneumonia is present in up to 90% of the patients and develops three to five days after symptom onset. 40% of the patients require oxygen and 6% mechanical ventilation, most of them non-invasive. 5% of the patients needed ICU admission and just a few received ECMO support. Next slide. When we think of a patient with COVID infection and pulmonary complications, we need to acknowledge that we are facing a new disease and that no evidence-based guidelines exist. So we need guidance from daily experience and we have to learn from the patient every day. I will give you my impressions based on observation and lots of discussion with colleagues. In the table, you can see the highlights of our initial protocol. In COVID pneumonia, we need to be permissive with oxygenation, since hypoxia is very well tolerated in the so-called happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia period. And we want to avoid ox oxygen damage to the lungs. We will start oxygen in patients with saturations around 90% in room air, targeting to increase it to 91 or 92%. When we assess for the need of mechanical ventilation, we need to distinguish between hypoxemia and respiratory failure. Three parameters need to be taken into account. First, saturation and oxygen uh, requirements. Second, breathing situation, tachypnea, use of respiratory muscles, dyspnea, fatigue. And third, neurological status. We see a high prevalence of delirium and other mental states in these patients that can be relevant at the time of defining, of defining invasive versus non-invasive ventilation. Initially, a strategy of, uh, of early intubation and minimization of a non-invasive approach was suggested. Now we are less aggressive with that since we have seen many patients do well after some days with high flow nasal cannula or CPAP, EPAP. The first being preferred for its less likelihood of aerosolization and better tolerance. And we may be avoiding the 50 to 80% mortality rate that has been reported on intubated patients. Also, we need to acknowledge the lack of resources such as ventilators in some circumstances. So non-invasive ventilation can play an important role, both looking at the patient and at the environment parameters. On the other side, we need to be in armed surveillance since we don't want to rush into a crash intubation, increasing the risk for the patient and the security of the team. If the patient is on mechanical ventilation, we need to look at the lung compliance. In early stages, they may be compliant, so we may use low PEEP and higher oxygen, always targeting at uh, the low uh, PO2 side. 
In more advanced stages, we can see less compliance as organizing pneumonia and fibrosis appear. Then lessons from respiratory distress syndrome can be applied, and we may use protective ventilation with higher PEEP and lower volumes. Recruitment maneuvers can help optimize ventilator settings and define the best PEEP. Of notice, we have seen surprisingly good results with formation, even in non-ventilated patients. So we, we would recommend trying it in both in scenarios as the effect on oxygenation is immediate, although it may not be sustained when we achieve the supine position again. PV ECMO should be considered with caution in selected patients and depending on the center resources. We have had a 50% survival after PV ECMO expand so far. Next slide. But we need to acknowledge uh, that there's a whole spectrum of pulmonary complications in COVID patients that go far beyond the initial pneumonia that you can see on the picture in the left. We can distinguish the viremic phase and the inflammatory phase, probably followed by a third chronic phase where organizing pneumonia and fibrosis arise. Some reports suggested that the inflammatory phase could be less intense in transplanted patients, accounting for not so bad outcomes as expected in our population. The truth on this will need to be cleared out in the future with ongoing registries. As a sample, the two pictures in the, in the middle belong to one of my heart transplant patients currently in the ICU. As seen in the CT scan, there are important areas of delayed organizing pneumonia and fibrosis with no inflammatory markers in blood tests. Of notice, the patient has, was never intubated despite the severity of the lesions that you see and is doing well on high flows. On the top right, you can see a CT scan image of a massive bilateral pneumothorax on a patient after recruiting maneuvers. He was on VV ECMO at the time and surprisingly could also cope hemodynamically. On the bottom right, you can find a complex case. There's peripheral organizing pneumonia with a big right artery pulmonary thrombus. In fact, lung embolisms are frequent in this population and need to be ruled out, especially in, special, in patients with high TGMR or inflammation parameters, as well as disproportionate oxygenation uh, difficulties. At the same time, we can't recommend full anticoagulation for our patients since we have also seen some life-threatening bleeding episodes. Notice the pulmonary hematoma in the same patient's scan. Of course, other infectious complications such as bacterial and fungal pneumonia need to be ruled out if, if fever or infiltrates reappear. Thank you. Dr. Amirati. Hello, that's uh, Enrico Amirati from uh, Milano, Niguarda Hospital. It's a pleasure to, to be part of this uh, conference. Next slide, please. Cardi cardiac injury is a recognized marker of prognosis in COVID-19 patients and the rate of cardiac injury uh, defined as an increase in um, troponin level is estimated between 7.7 7 to 27.8% of COVID-19 patients. And uh, the mortality in, uh, in COVID-19 patients with cardiac injury is estimated between 23% to 51%. Cardiac injury especially in critically ill COVID-19 patient is reported in a, in a um, submitted paper from China to 38% of, uh, of cases, in 38% of cases. If you look at the um, uh, bottom left panel, you see the proportion of cases with, uh, with cardiac injury defined as an increase of troponin from admission to up to two weeks, more than two weeks of follow-up uh, in the hospital. And you can see how non-critically ill patients have almost no cardiac injury, while patients that develop, uh, that become uh, uh, critically ill, <clears throat> critically ill, they have uh, um, an increased uh, prevalence of cardiac injury. 
And if you look at patients that are critically ill, but that, that they survive, you see that the proportion of cardiac injury reduce after three, um, about three days after admission, while in patients that uh, where cardiac injury persist after three to, to four days of admission, the, the outcome is poor. So they are mainly the patients that, uh, that are critically ill non-survivors. And the critically ill definition is based on, on uh, need for uh, uh, admission in the intensive care unit or mechanical ventilation or, uh, or shock. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the level of troponin, again, you see that uh, it's clearly almost uh, since the beginning from, uh, on admission that patients with a higher level of, of troponin are uh, at increased uh, risk. So uh, even if uh, in this setting is very difficult to perform uh, echocardiogram or even ECG, uh, this marker that uh, is very uh, important and is in relation with, uh, with the prognosis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. And um, so um, we do not generally perform ECG or echocardiogram uh, on admission. And uh, acute myocarditis can be a, a clinical manifestation of COVID-19. And um, at least based on the cases that we manage or based on, on, the, on the literature, that there are just uh, a few. Often these patients present with just, just chest pain and mild respiratory symptoms. And uh, there are two cases where we have uh, the endomyocardial biopsy and there is no evidence of SARS coronavirus to uh, direct cardiac injury. Just in one case uh, with uh, uh, um, ultra, ultrasound uh, um, with uh, micros electronic mic microscopy, they found uh, uh, the coronavirus just uh, in one macrophage, interstitial macrophage in the heart, but not uh, in the cardiomyocytes. There is uh, no evidence of inflammatory infiltrate as expected in classical myocarditis, even if uh, uh, this picture, for instance, from a patient from Brescia uh, that is published in JAMA Cardiology, you can see these are here, so they represent edema. There is an intense edema diffused at, in the whole myocardium. And it's also found in, a, in another case where they perform endomyocardial biopsy, but they, do not, they did not find inflammatory infiltrates. So a potential explanation is that the cardiac injury can be related to a non-specific cytokine-mediated cardiotoxicity. That is something also described for a CAR T cell therapy. Next slide, please, the, the last one. This is an example of uh, Takotsubo syndrome as a complication of a critically ill COVID-19 patient. And it's, um, uh, she, she's a 76 uh, woman admitted uh, in ICU due to a uh, severe pneumonia with a respiratory insufficiency that needed uh, um, intubation uh, the, the first day. At admission, uh, there was a slight increase uh, in, uh, in troponin, high sensitivity troponin 19, and you can see the ECG uh, on, on top uh, uh, C with letter C. And uh, after 16 days when the patient was, uh, um, was extubated, she developed an um, atakotsubo with, with the typical apical ballooning. I, I was not able to, to upload the, the videos, but it's clear that there are no R waves from V on V1 to V4 um, on on ECG and troponin rise to 176 and after uh, some, some days you can see that when the patient was was finally uh, extubated that the left ventricle ejection fraction increased and there was a, a recovery of a R wave with the uh, um, normalization of troponin. So it's important to remind that also Takotsubo can be an important cardiac manifestation in these patients. Thank you.
Thanks very much. We'll now move on to Dr. Aslam. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Emily, as well as the planning committee for inviting me to participate. Can you go next? So in terms of therapeutics, there are almost 400 clinical trials currently registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, unfortunately, most of these are ongoing. So in terms of current published data, it's mostly anecdotal and you know, mostly case series. There are only a few trials that have been published. There are a variety of drugs that are undergoing evaluation for treatment of COVID-19. And what I show here is just a small subset of uh, current drugs being investigated. Next. What I'd like to do is focus on literature that's been newly available within the past week. Next. So uh, this is a clinical trial that was, or not a clinical trial, but um, a case series of 53 patients that was just published in New England on Friday. Um, of note, the data is from the manufacturers, so it's Gilead data, and they basically give us uh, an overview of compassionate use of remdesivir for patients. So in terms of patients that were included in this compassionate use um, protocol were patients that had COVID-19 and were hypoxic, um, but did not have any evidence of multi-system organ failure. So patients did not have, uh, you know, creatinine clearance was more than 30, liver enzymes were usually within normal, and no vasopressors. Patients received remdesivir for 10 days. And um, the endpoint was noted at day 28. This endpoint consisted of looking at live discharge, as well as a two-point reduction in the ordinal scale, and I'll go over that scale in a minute. So I think what's most interesting to note is of these 53 patients, uh, only a subset of 34 were on invasive ventilation, and the rest were non-invasive. Median duration of illness at the time that remdesivir was started was 12 days. Next. So this is our main data result table. On the top, on the x-axis is the number is where patients were at baseline. So you can see 34 were on uh, required invasive ventilation and the rest were non-invasive low flow oxygen. On the left hand, which is the y-axis, is basically where patients were after the end of treatment in terms of oxygen support. And so they uh, basically developed an ordinal scale in terms of one being the best outcome in patients who were live discharged and death number six being the worst outcome. So based on this, it, you know, they, they try to show that about overall 50% of patients in the invasive group got better. Um, and, you know, people with mild and moderate disease, a great percent also improved. Their overall mortality in the study was 13%. And again, I think this is lower compared to other published data from critically ill patients. But I think what's important to keep in mind is that these patients were very carefully selected and again, did not have multi-system organ failure or you know, a need for vasopressors. So my take home from this is that it basically showed remdesivir was safe to use in terms of serious adverse events. Um, but in terms of efficacy, they have ongoing clinical trials, which I think will be much more helpful. And one of those ongoing trials compares remdesivir to placebo for moderate disease. Next. The other interesting uh, drug that a lot of people are in trial six inhibitors, in particular tesaluzumab. So what I show here is a single center experience. It's basically a case series of 15 patients in China. Of these 15, seven patients were critically ill. And when they received a one-time dose of tesaluzumab, four of the seven survived. Um, and all patients had elevated IL-6 levels, which were then reduced uh, post-dosing post of tesaluzumab. Next. Um, so, Sort of caveats to this, and this is true for several studies uh, that I go over, their follow-up is just one week. There are no clinical details in terms of what constituted critically ill patients, and there's no comparator group. Next. The next, uh, the next group is also a case series of 20 patients, again from China. These are 20 patients with severe critical COVID-19, uh, again, not well described, and all received a one-time dose of tesaluzumab. 
The key point here for me was the discharge home. So 19 of these 20 patients were actually discharged home after average of almost two weeks. And they noted that CT scan lesions uh, sh showed almost resolution in the majority, but it's unclear in terms of what that time period was. And uh, next, there are certain caveats here. One more. The additional caveats with this study, similar to the before one, is that there's no duration of follow-up. There's no details of what constituted severe critical disease and no comparator. Next. This is a trial also that was just uh, recently put up as a preprint. Uh, this is from China. Um, this is a trial looking at the use of hydroxychloroquine in a blinded fashion. For inclusion, patients had to be positive uh, via PCR for COVID-19, and they had to have chest CT evidence of pneumonia. However, patients were not hypoxic. So I think that's important to keep in mind. In my mind, that's mild disease. They excluded patients uh, with critical illness as well as a variety of other indications uh, listed here. They had 62 patients with one-to-one -one randomization, but no sample size or power cap calculation. And uh, 31 patients received hydroxychloroquine at a dose of 200 milligrams twice a day for five days, compared to their standard of care, which is listed here. So oxygen, uh, unknown antiviral, unknown antibiotic, and immunoglobulin. Next. Of note for control patients, they had uh, a day longer in terms of fever and cough uh, compared to the hydroxychloroquine arm. Next. And this is sort of their main results table. And the red box is sort of uh, the main gist of it, basically showing that patients that were in the control arm, about 55% had improvement. Uh, patients that were in the hydroxychloroquine arm, about 80% had improvement. Uh, next. The details uh, or the issues with this study, again, there were no biological endpoints. And improvement here basically meant day six. So patients received five days of Plaquenil, and day six is when they assessed if patients had improved or not. Um, and again, there was unclear duration of illness at the time of enrollment. So what I presented basically are just early literature from the past one week. Um, as you can see, there are a variety of methodological issues, which makes it really difficult to see if any of these drugs actually led to a therapeutic effect. And so I think what we really need are proper trials uh, with clinically meaningful endpoints. Uh, that, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we'll be completing this section with Dr. Tana. Thank you, Emily. Thank you to the committee for inviting me to share our experience. Next slide. Um, so we at Northwestern have developed a uniform checklist to help to facilitate safe discharges. This requires a multidisciplinary approach with a heavy social work involvement. Uh, Northwestern is in the heart of downtown Chicago, so some of the common issues that come up are trying to find alternatives to mass transit, ride shares, and unsuitable living situations. Upon discharge, all of our patients are given one surgical mask. They're also given um, uniform instructions for, at discharge in our EMR regarding duration of self-isolation per the current CDC guidelines. If the patient has a positive COVID-19 test or it's pending at discharge, they're automatically enrolled in our uh, monitoring program. This involves a daily MyChart questionnaire. This is followed up by a phone call if they report any concerning symptoms or don't respond to the MyChart. If they have severe symptoms, they are instructed to return to the emergency room with a proper handoff. Next slide. We've also embedded an extra layer of monitoring for our transplant recipients. So for our solid organ transplant recipients that are COVID positive, they're enrolled in our transplant watch list. This involves a daily call from the transplant team. Since we don't have the ability to retest right now, we are extending their COVID infection flag in the EMR for 40 days. Um, we are trying to minimize the amount of in-person follow-up for these patients, but if required, we have a protocol where outpatient lo labs can be done safely in the infectious disease clinic with full PPE. Next slide. And then with regard to home management, um, if a patient that is a transplant recipient calls with fever and or respiratory symptoms, a known COVID contact, or positive testing, we add them to the transplant watch list as well with our COVID positive discharges. 
One of our transplant nurses calls every day with a symptom check template. If they're getting worse, they're directed to call 911 or to come to the Northwestern ER with a proper handoff. Um, our census is usually around 35 patients each day. And as of Friday, when I made these slides, we had 11 total COVID positive patients admitted via the watch list. Most notably, all of them were initially admitted to the floor. The benefits of this is that these patients are getting early medical attention at Northwestern where their transplant team knows them. They have access to clinical trial medications um, and our ICU team. And this more focus on our patient condition rather than the accessibility of outpatient testing access. So when we had um, reduced testing capability, our protocol really didn't change. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much to all of our speakers. I just have a few little questions for uh, each of you. Um, Ali, I wonder if you could share with us your approach to the management of ACEs and ARB inhibitors um, in your patients, given the questions about receptors for the virus. Have you changed that? Yeah, so, so far our practice has been to not, not hold those drugs if uh, the patients came on uh, came to the hospital on one of those drugs, unless there's another compelling reason to stop. So, you know, if they develop severe AKI or have hyperkalemia or something like that, but uh, otherwise we've not been making any changes. And I think there's been a paucity of evidence showing that doing so would cause any benefit. Great, thank you. Marta, you brought up the issue of embolic complications, specifically pulmonary emboli, and that's something we've been worried about too. What is your approach to anticoagulation for these ICU patients? Yes, we've been discussing that a lot in our in our center. Um, so basically, they are uh, on prophylactic anticoagulation anytime they go into the ICU. We uh, increase the doses to milligram per kilo if they have a D dimer that's over three thousand, and if something's wrong with their oxygenation, we go for CT scan. We try to restrict CT scans at first because it was re it was so cumbersome to move them to the radiology department and so on. But in the first 50 scans that we performed, just following the simple rules, just uh, D-dimer over 3,000 and oxygenation issues beyond expected, we, in the first 50, as I'm telling you, we, we found 25 patients with a MOLI. So um, we are trying to, uh, as I say, increase anticoagulation to milligram per kilo if something looks too inflammatory or the damage is high and go straight for CT scan if there's any minimal doubt. Great, thank you. Enrico, you spoke about some of the cardiac injury issues being related to cytokines. I'm wondering if you've tried cytokine blockade in any aspects for your patients in whom you're concerned about this. We have a recent experience, for instance, with a um, transplanted patient, but in that case, uh, um, a cardiac transplanted patient, and in that case, uh, there was no, um, I mean, uh, decrease of the ejection fraction. But for instance, in a patient on a cyclosporin plus a mycophenolate plus a low dosage of prednisone, that patient developed um, an, a significant inflammatory response with a C-reactive protein of 105 with a upper reference limit of 0 0.5. So uh, interleukin-6 was 86. So we, we treated this patient with the tocilizumab when it was, it was dependent on uh, CPAP, and we had a significant improvement uh, uh, in uh, two days. So it's, it's almost our standard of treatment, in particular in patients without any um, infective, uh, uh, super in, superimposed infection with a high level of interleukin-6. While for patients with myocarditis, for instance, uh, um, one of the patient we described in JAMA cardiology from Brescia, Brescia we, treat, uh, we treated this patient with the corticosteroids, intravenous corticosteroids, and the dosage was uh, one to uh, two uh, milligram per kilogram intravenously for three to five days. And there is also another paper in the European Heart Journal 
in a patient with cardiogenic shock that that um, he was treated with a, a steroids with a significant improvement. So I believe that uh, even if we do not have a, a simple uh, reply that could be applied for patients with uh, with myocarditis, at least based on this uh, just personal experience. Great, thank you, Simon. You brought up the issue of just bringing up research from the past week, and I think one of the things we're all dealing with is how rapidly this is changing. How do you determine what you're going to use for treatment protocols for your patients when the field is changing so quickly? Um, so one of the, I think that's a really good point. Part of it is I think all of us are getting data exhaustion from multiple trials and case series. So some of the, the data that I highlighted, I think, you know, they're not convincing, and especially I think for hydroxychloroquine, there's a chance of greater harm than good, in my opinion. Um, so we are lucky in that we have a number of clinical trials at our institution. So our goal really is for these patients to be um, you know, enrolled in these clinical trials and get treatment in that way. Um, the tocilizumab in particular, I, I'm interested and I'd like to use it. I think there probably is a subset of patients that we need to identify that will perhaps uh, be better served by receiving it versus in general. Um, so, and for mild disease, I had a patient last week, we're not treating with anything at all, just doing uh, daily phone checks with the patient. Great, thank you. And Sejal, um, one of the questions that I wonder about is when we have transplant patients who are trying to keep at home, what do we tell them about their household contacts? Is there, there special advice you give to them regarding household contact or nothing additional? Yeah, so um, some of the main things is that we try to have them self-isolate in their own bedroom and try to have their own private uh, bathroom. And this is also something that's coming into play for safe discharges. If people are sharing those common spaces, then we try to get them a hotel or work with social work for alternative housing. Great, thank you. Thanks all for a wonderful presentation. So now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Lloyd Ratner. Thank you, Emily. So uh, now we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the, to wrap this up, the ethical issues and uh, utilization of resources. Next slide, please. We have um, three uh, ethical experts. We have Dr. Angie Wall and Dr. Juliana Testa, both of whom are abdominal organ transplant surgeons at Baylor University in Dallas. And from above the diaphragm, we have Dr. Andrew Courtright, who's a transplant pulmonologist and a medical ethicist at the University of Pennsylvania. So next slide, please. So why don't we go ahead? All right, this is Angie Wall. I'm gonna start it off. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today for this discussion. We're gonna talk about the ethical challenges of uh, managing resources and transplantation in COVID-19. So as everybody is aware, we are used to dealing with scarcity in, uh, in organ transplantation and donor organs in particular. And across the world, we've developed consistent, transparent, organ-specific allocation schemes that prioritize recipients who match with each donor based on factors such as waiting time or severity of disease. While these allocation schemes are still in place, many centers have had to shift their approaches to transplantation based on this absolute scarcity of all sorts of resources, such as ICU and hospital be beds, ventilators, medications, and PPE. So we do have a practical problem, which is who can we transplant given the limitations and resources that we're facing, but we also have an ethical question, and that is who should we transplant based on these limitations? Next slide, please. So what we can do is we can start by using the principles that we always use for allocation. The first being distributive justice. So what that does is it gives us principles on how to prioritize patients for transplantation. What is gonna happen with distributive justice is that it's a moving target in, uh, based on where we are in the COVID incidence curve. 
So for example, if I currently have the resources for transplantation, but I'm expecting a decrease in resources, the underlying principle for who should get transplanted might be to focus on maximum benefits with minimum resource use. So something like a straightforward kidney transplant. Whereas when resources become even more severely restrained, the focus is gonna shift more to a sickest first allocation, such as status 1A hearts or fulminant uh, liver failure patients. Now there are other, other ethical um, principles that we have to think about. One is balancing risks and benefits. As we've heard in this talk already, there are risks associated with COVID infection um, in transplant patients that are uh, that we're getting data on every every day and it's changing. And so this is a consideration as uh, for hospitals that are in areas, especially with community spread and the risks of nos nosocomial infection, those may outweigh the benefit of transplantation in certain patients. Another ethical principle is that of respect for autonomy. So um, as we have to do uh, in other situations, we have to keep our patients informed and we have to keep them informed about both the, the knowns and the unknowns of the current situation, of the potential for the unknown course of COVID infections in post-transplant patients, but the real risk of morbidity and mortality, as well as the false negative rates of donor testing and the potential for donor-derived infections um, that we have not yet seen, but we might see. Finally, and perhaps the most important point is that we really do need to maintain clarity, transparency, and consistency in the way that we make our programmatic decisions about who we're gonna transplant so that we can maintain trust in organ transplantation and in our, uh, in our programs. And we'll move on to the next slide and Dr. Courtright is gonna talk about that one. Thank you. So when we do reach a uh, situation where we've transitioned from usual standards of care to crisis standards of care, it's been well acknowledged that the ethical guidelines and allocation principles shift away from our common principles in transplants, such as rescuing the sickest, to allocation where the primary goal is to maximize the number of lives saved with additional considerations for the number of life years or life cycle years preserved along with um, some considerations regarding healthcare providers and other essential workers. Regardless of the allocation framework, but particularly in crisis standards of care, these allocation decisions should treat all patients equally. And that includes both COVID and non-COVID, including transplant patients, where what we're trying to assess is what is the benefit to this particular patient for this particular resource, given his or her comorbidities, current clinical status and combination of severe or major life-limiting comorbidities. In all of these cases, they're extremely complex assessments and they should be made in close coordination with triage teams or triage officers and should include an honest assessment of the likely duration of post-transplant recovery and the need for local institutional resources as well as the risk for clinical deterioration following index hospitalization. But overall, it's extremely important to remember that we're embedding transplant within this framework and not that this is a framework that is solely designed to direct resources towards COVID-19 patients. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Angie and, and uh, Andrew. Um, let me, in the few remaining minutes that we have here, let me ask you a couple of questions. The, Angie, you talked about the unknowns, and certainly we're really in uncharted uh, waters here with very little available data, particularly about long-term risks and effects. So what we really have is a catch-22 here, because if we wind up taking the conservative approach in terms of suspending transplantation or largely curtailing transplantation, we're not gonna be able to get the data. So how do we square this? Or how do we address this from an ethical standpoint? So one thing, and this is really what, um, one of the things that Andrew uh, brought up is that we do have knowns. We know that a patient in fulminant hepatic failure, for example, is going to die if they don't get a transplant. What we don't know is how they'll do if they also somehow get a COVID infection afterward. And so we can't just say that we have to send all of our resources toward COVID-19 and uh, not take care of these other patients that have significant risk of mortality 
And uh, so I don't think that curtailing all transplantation makes sense in the setting of the greater medical system, just like not treating heart attacks doesn't make any sense. So um, I do think that we have to take into account the fact that our patients do face significant uh, morbidity and risk of mortality. And if we stop transplants, then uh, I think we are doing a disservice to transplantation and to our patients in general. But how conservative should we really be if we're not getting, you know, because it may be that it may be reasonably safe to transplant some patients who aren't that sick. Yeah, this is this is Juliano Festa, but that's important in, in view of the data that we saw in the first slide from Yunus, whereby interestingly enough, the we saw an interesting drop, significant drop in the number of kidney transplant patients that if you think about are also the ones among other transplant being this thoracic or abdominal absorb less resources. And if you look at this in terms of the greater good and taking care of as many patients you want, whether those are transplant patients or not, you may want to think that would be a good ethical approach really to start discussing whether you can really save a lot of lives by doing the transplant that absorbs less resources in general. So that is a conversation that in you know, honesty should be carried on once the, now that the shock is being absorbed as we speak and we go into the next phase which is many the phase after the shock the shock of the pandemia well so that brings up a good point julie director of a transplant center um and as we start coming out of this you know there's going to be a backlog of cases for uh that from virtually every discipline that's going to be everyone's going to want to demand their resources uh so you know in transplant we've sort of gotten used to the idea because of the whole issue with met the metrics um in terms of deciding what's right for our institution versus what's right for our patients how are you going to make the argument to get the most resources that we could get for our transplant patients as we start coming out of this OR time, hospital beds, et cetera? This is a, a very important point. Uh, our institution already told us that we're going to have a significant restriction in uh, financial uh, support for all service lines, including transplant. So I think that will really start a, a nationwide conversation on how to work better together in terms of decreasing, for example, the cost of, I, I make an example, the traveling of procurement. At the end of the day, if you see this from a, a cumulative point of view, uh, in, in an entire basket, you can really do a lot within your institution and we can do a lot within centers in helping each other because it's gonna be affecting all of us. Okay. And down to making sure that you're dealing with these questions at a centralized level within the institution in a way that is both fair and consistent for non-transplant and transplant patients, where you're really thinking about medical need, you're reflecting on kind of a return to the usual standard of care guiding ethical principles, and not just saying, what can we do right now to maximize resources once you're out of that phase of care? Okay, and let me ask one other question that's sort of related to Another aspect of transplantation that we haven't talked about much during this whole crisis, but um, you know, living donor transplants we could defer. The, the donors hopefully will still be around when we when we get back to transplanting at full speed. But deceased donors, they're a one-shot deal, right? And if those organs are declined uh, or not utilized for one reason or another then we result in the loss of a scarce resource or a scarce opportunity. So what ethical obligation do we owe the potential recipients, and more importantly, the donor families to try and optimally utilize these organs? So I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, there is, uh, 
there's a great article by Ezekiel Emanuel written in the New England Journal uh, about uh, ethical uh, considerations in uh, in scarce resource situations in, in COVID-19. And one of the things that he brings up is this idea of instrumental value of, um, and what he talks about is the healthcare workers. And so they should get some sort of priority for treatment because of their instrumental value of giving back to um, the uh, treatment of COVID patients. But what I think about with instrumental value is the instrumental value of a deceased donor. That deceased donor has the potential of saving multiple lives. And so when you think about the utilization of resources for a deceased donor, what you can get out of that utilization is is the saving the lives of several patients who would die otherwise. And so when you're um, when we are in triage situations, especially deceased donors who are have the likelihood of donating multiple organs um, should really be considered as a priority, I think even still, and we can see that because even uh, the, the um, presentations we saw at the start, we're not stopping all deceased donation everyone is trying to continue with some level of deceased donation because as you noted Lloyd this is a this is a very limited resource um, one thing I would I would bring as a caveat is we should be thoughtful about the amount of time that we take for working up donors and accepting offers so that we decrease the uh, the the drain on resources from that if you don't need a test or you can do it in the operating room then don't do don't request things that are going to delay the operating room time. If we use local recovery, we don't have to factor in travel time, uh, so that can that can decrease the amount of time that you're utilizing uh, resources as well. Great. So, uh, Andrew, uh, Angie, and Giuliano, thank you very much for the this thoughtful discussion. It, this is about wrapping us up. We have a couple of other uh, housekeeping issues. I'd like to thank all the other organizers of this and all the societies that have contributed. I'd like to thank all the participants who spent their time and data and, and shared that. Uh, there will be, we have two little polls I'll ask you to, to answer uh, for all the, part, anyone who's uh, been uh, listening to this webinar. Uh, and the first is, and you can just click on your screen, I found this webinar to be helpful in expanding my understanding of COVID-19 and its impact. You could select one of the following, strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. So everyone please click on that. And then the second question is, I would be interested in participating in or viewing future updates to this webinar. Uh, and then the same graded responses. Again, this webinar uh, will be available online in relatively short order. Uh, there will also be uh, some additional pre recorded modules that will recover precautions for the procurement team, screening donors and candidates protecting the workforce in terms of surgical aspects and protecting the workforce in terms of infection control. Uh, it seems like there were a, a live of about 600 uh, uh, viewers who started with this webinar and we still have over 400 left at the end of it. So uh, thank you all for staying on and uh, be on the lookout for additional webinars and we're even considering for the additional webinars being able to grant CME or, or maintenance of certification for a nominal fee. So uh, stay safe and uh, look forward for you joining us in the future webinars.